failed social experiment. But how do we tell this story in a way that builds the kind of emotional momentum that colorblind ideology builds? So many young brothers and sisters of the younger generation find themselves so far removed from the best of their past. What are we going to make out of the nothing we've been given? How do you envision possibility? We're really delighted. We have an extraordinary guest with us on the tightrope um, today. We have Professor Noam Chomsky, who is an extraordinary thinker and scholar. And uh, we want to really welcome you to the tightrope, Professor Chomsky. And uh, we'll try to jump right in and have a conversation. But welcome, welcome, welcome to the tightrope. Thank you very much. Before we dive into the deep end, I just wanted to ask, um, a lot of people out here care for you and think of you as, you know, a, a, a very important sort of, you know, figure, spiritual leader in a way. And we're wondering how you're doing with this pandemic. So can you give us a sense of how you're doing and how you're feeling? And is, is everything OK? It's pretty simple. Staying at home, not seeing anybody. Uh, fortunately, we we're in Arizona. We we're land is given away it's very cheap so we bought a small house out of town has a lot of desert behind no people a lot of rattlesnakes but they don't carry covid so we can walk around uh, let the dogs run a little we're not totally cooped up but i'm busier than i've ever been in my life it turns out everybody in the world once an interview, a talk, a statement. Uh, so I'm on this device constantly, not with great efficiency, as you saw, but somehow managing. But it's not a big problem for us. Right, right. Well, I'm glad. I'm sure many people will be, yeah, very happy to hear that. No, but I think one of the reasons why they, they're coming after you tooth and nail is that you are an international treasure, bona fide, unadulterated intellectual genius, reforming linguistic cognitive science. In his 20s, the syntactic structures comes out and the impact is overwhelming. Freedom fighter par excellence, be it Mm. occupation, domination, exploitation, no matter what it is, there's an unbelievable prophetic impulse shot through the scientific analysis of empire, of capitalism, of authoritarian forms of mm. socialism and so forth. And then that there's just a just wonderful gnome. I mean, just an exemplary truth teller, always on call, always ready to lend his time, his energy, and to look at it now, 91 years young. Mm all the way from Fair Hill Street, East Oak Lane, northern section of Philadelphia, strong as ever. Mm. A beautiful thing, brother. Yeah, good old Northeast Philadelphia. <laughs> it's still so humble, still so, but, but, but let, 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 let's look at this present situation though. This unprecedented moment of multi-layered catastrophes, the possibility of the planet going under, be it nuclear or ecological, the wealth inequality, the escalating neo-fascism, the, the xenophobic resurgences all around the world. How, as an intellectual, does one sustain the vocation that you talked about way back in 1967, that February 23rd piece, the responsibility of intellectuals, delivered at the Hell House Society at Harvard? initially in Mosaic Journal and then in the New York Review of Books. How do you sustain that? And what do you make of where most of the intelligentsia actually resides and habits and rights these days? Mm. Easy to sustain. There's basically two, three reasons. The one reason is just looking at history. If you look at history, it's been through very hard times. Uh, a lot has been accomplished. In many ways, it's a much better country, much better world than it was in 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Not in all respects, but in many respects. The many battles that were fought hard and won, we can just take for granted and move on. That's one reason. Another reason is just seeing the remarkable, impressive dedication and activism of lots of people. Uh, so take just what happened after the 
murder of George Floyd. The, very quickly, the most substantial social movement in American history developed spontaneously with enormous public support, lots of solidarity, working hard to change things that are important with courage, enthusiasm. That's another reason. There's a third reason. You basically don't have any choice. You can either say, everything's hopeless, I give up, help ensure that the worst will happen, or you can grasp the opportunities that exist, and they do exist, and maybe you can make it a better world. It's not much of a choice. Those three very easy reasons to sustain commitment to the extent that you can. And yet most, I mean, so many of our fellow intellectuals decide to be conformist and complacent or downright cowardly. There's something else going on that has been able to sustain you going in the opposite direction. People make their choices. We can make ours. These are the ones we ought to make. There's good reasons for them. You make them. Treasure makes them. I try to make them. The more that do, the better we, chance we have for decent survival. Mm. And we should recognize that the issues today are literally survival. It's yeah. kind of remarkable to look at the massive coverage of the two conventions and see that the most crucial issues that have arisen in all of human history are not mentioned. I try to find the word, I mean, the critical difference between the parties, whatever you think about them, there actually is a chasm on two crucial essential issues, issues of survival. Are we going to be able to address the growing environmental catastrophe in time, or are we not? That's a question that has to be answered within a decade or two. And whatever you think of the Democrats, Trump is alone in the world in pressing the accelerator to race to disaster. If this malignancy is not removed, we may not survive another four years of this, may get to even irreversible tipping points. Uh, if not, it'll certainly be much harder to deal with the problems that remain in the brief period ahead. No, virtually no mention. The other issue, which is equally uh, existential, is the threat of terminal nuclear war. It's higher now than it has been even during the Cold War, and increasing. I mean, to the extent that the doomsday clock last January, where the analysts dropped minutes, moved to seconds. And since then, Trump has made it worse, dismantling the last remnants of the arms control regime, which set some constraints on the threat of total destruction, and uh, moving to develop new, more threatening weapons in violation of past treaties, which essentially entices others to do the same. Uh, that means limiting the prospect of survival, the darkening the shadow that we've been living under for 75 years. No mention. Lots of talk about other things, but not the two questions that human beings now face for the first time in human history, the questions whether the human experiment will continue in the short term. We're not talking about millennia or centuries. We're talking about decades and nobody's talking about it. It's a shocking comment on the whole social order. There's many other problems, urgent, significant ones, but these, if these aren't solved, everything else is moot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder. I wonder if if um, there's a relationship between that silence um, and the kind of stoking of fear that is so much a part of the the public political consciousness. In other words, is there a possibility that 
they know or we know, right, that this that this is moving toward the end. And so rather than deal with that, right, we sort of end up in a in a state of constant uh, you know, fear mongering and you know, hate production and a kind of a terror of the end of the world as we know it, but brought very small, right? The end of a social world as we know it in our neighborhood, in our town, in our community, rather than an end of the world as we know it in a, in a big sense. Well, fortunately, there are people who are working hard on it, not ignoring it. I take the environmental crisis, uh, take Sunrise Movement, mm -hmm. group of young people, uh, actively working to try to bring this issue to the core of public attention and activism. As you know, they sat in on congressional offices. They received some support from the young, uh, some of the young uh, representatives who came in on the Sanders wave, especially Alexandria or Casio Cortez, gained the support of a Democratic Senator, Senior Senator Ed Markey has been interested in the environment. They managed to put the question of a new, a Green New Deal on the legislative agenda. Shortly before lots of ridicule, dismissal, who cares about that? It's only essential for human survival. Only that. And it is. Some form of Green New Deal is essential for human survival. There are forms that are quite feasible, that fall well within our capacities. And unless we implement them within the next few years, we can say goodbye to each other. Okay, so these young people succeeded in doing it. That's exciting. Then they have been working with the climate strike last, last year, huge effort of young people to try to awaken the world, uh, the uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, others, the activism that's continued and compelled the Democratic National Committee, which doesn't want any of this, but compelled them to at least include in the program uh, policies which are not enough, but which could make a significant dent and are miles uh, away from the destructive policies of the incumbent in power. Okay, will they implement those policies? Well, it's a battle inside the Democratic Party. Uh, the DNC is uh, basically is Clintonite, uh, moderate Republicans call themselves Democrats, uh, donor oriented. Then there's the progressive base, which is struggling to do something about the existential crises we, fed, we, we face. And we see the battle constantly. So for example, the activists managed to pressure both Biden and Harris to accept the idea of ending subsidies to fossil fuel industries, to stop funding the industries that are working to destroy us. They agreed to that. The DNC got wind of it, cut it out of the program. Okay, the deal remains, but that doesn't. That's the battle internal to the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, the Republicans are racing to disaster. The world is looking at this aghast. They can't hardly believe what's happening here, but it's happening and we have to deal with it and we can. We can follow the lead of people like the Sunrise Movement, the young activists who carried out the climate strike, and those who are working hard now to try to implement these programs to force the Democratic Party to accept at least what it has on paper, not to back off in case they win the election, which is no sure thing, but in case they win the election, not to back off and say, we have to go back to uh, worrying about the deficit, which is totally crazy at this time. But then in order to pressure them, it's going to be necessary to continue the constant activism. And the fact that this is, that the leadership 
is being led to young people is so unspeakable, you hard to find words for it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the ones who should be taking the lead, it's the adult community who should be doing it. But in the absence of a committed adult community, they are doing it, calling us to action. And we have the chance to follow that we can do it. And the same on the other issues. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, this issue of um, wrestling with despair on the one hand and on the other hand, knowing something must be done and we've got to be the ones to do it. When I think of uh, intellectuals who are making a difference in a lot of ways, but seem to be much more uh, uh, wrestling with despair more than what I see in your work over these last 70 years or so. I'm thinking of people like my dear brother Chris Hedges or brother Paul Street or uh, 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 even my dear brother Jumu Baraka, who I, who, who's such a major force, and he's probably less wrestling with despair than the others. How do you look unflinchingly at all of the suffering and misery in the world, past and present, and still allow uh, uh, yourself to work through any kind of despair to be the kind of truth teller and justice seeker that you are? You can't succumb to it. I mean, yes, there are things that are going on that are just beyond horrible. Uh, we can see it in our own cities, we'll just mm -hmm. take things that are happening right before our eyes. So when the Trump administration uh, decides that now all the uh, significant officials, relevant officials come from the destructive industries and are given free, free reign. So when they decide as they did recently to uh, eliminate regulations on polluting industries, fossil fuel industries, polluting industries, to eliminate regulations, two effects. One effect is to escalate the race to oblivion, but there's a local effect. Who lives near those polluting industries? Not me. I live out in the outskirts of a, of a town. I can afford not to live next to the polluting industries. Other people can't, mostly black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic. They can't live anywhere else. So this decision is saying, I want to kill you. That's what it says. I don't care about you. I'll increase the pollution that's killing you and doing it in the midst of a respiratory pandemic mm -hmm. which, in which pollution radically increases the already sharply disparate, disparate effect, race, class effect of the pandemic. So right in the middle of this, I'll make it worse for you. Nobody comments on it. I mean, take say Trump's, he's carrying out a desperate effort to try to cover up the vicious crimes he's committed against the American people. Uh, 175,000 people have died, mostly needlessly. Uh, take a look at other countries. It's not happening. It's happening here because of the malevolence in the White House. Well, you can't come forward and say, sorry for killing all of you. So what we have to do is find a way to blame someone else. Pure cowardice and disgusting dishonesty, but it has effect. So when you decide to blame the World Health Organization and say, okay, let's destroy it. What happens? Things happen. Countless people in Africa and in Yemen and in other poor places rely on World Health Organization services simply to survive terrible diseases. That's even before the pandemic. So let's take away that security and let them die will kill them because that way maybe I can cover up my crimes and maybe it'll improve my electability. I mean, it's the kind of savagery that you can't find words for. And it's happening all over. 
and react as if it's not happening. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what, what you think about the role of the complicit um, members of his own party, you know, around this, you know, there's been, before Trump actually won, there was so much, you know, critique of all the characteristics you're describing, the greed, the lying, you know, the, the, the brash, um, you know, hostility and hatred, but everyone pretty much went quiet and got in line. You know, how do we explain that level of, of shift? These are people who had profound critiques and now had, have nothing to say. There's no, he's just sort of steamrolled over everybody. It's understandable that when people are in immediate trouble, they may tend to overlook other things. But it's the job of everyone who is trying to keep them, who is concerned with the fate of the species and with the suffering of people in the world. It's their job to keep your eyes, keep ensure that everyone's eyes are kept on the longer term perils that are that we are facing. So we will emerge from this pandemic at a terrible cost and a needless cost. All you have to do is look at other countries to see that it's a needless cost. Uh, China provided all the relevant evidence on January 10th and sequenced the virus. Uh, the genome gave the, uh, the information to the world. The countries that cared about their citizens acted at once. They now have it pretty much under control. Uh, East Asia, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, uh, New Zealand, Australia, a little later, Europe delayed, finally joined. Many of them have it reasonably under control. So the Germany probably has about maybe 150th or so the death rate that we have, rich country similar to us. Uh, the United States is the la global laggard because of the malignancy in the White House right there it's not obscure and it goes back before the pandemic started it's worth remembering what happened before uh, one thing is can't blame on trump it goes back to the whole neoliberal assault on the society uh, government is the problem not the solution so therefore when the warnings came in 2003 that after sars that we're likely to face a new pandemic the government, which has a wonderful laboratories, immense resources, couldn't step in to take the actions that could be taken. Now that's neoliberalism. That's on top of the fact that the drug companies couldn't move in because they're blocked by capitalist logic. You don't spend your money on things that don't make profit tomorrow. You don't spend your, your money trying to work on a vaccine that Maybe it'll be useful in 10 years and we won't make that much money from it anyway. So capitalist logic says that the hugely profitable drug companies with great labs and resources are blocked out. Neoliberalism, the plague we've been living under since Reagan and Thatcher says the government can't step in. Okay, nobody could pick up the ball. There were things you could do and it's worth remembering that some of them were done. So when President Obama came into office, in his first days in office, he called a meeting of the Presidential Scientific Advisory Council that had been set up by the first President Bush, and he requested that they work on a pandemic response program. Came back with it a couple of weeks later, it was put into place there was a pandemic response program. There were simulations carried out of what to happen if a pandemic comes, some of them as late as last October. There were American scientists working with Chinese colleagues on the very dangerous but crucial uh, efforts to identify new coronaviruses in the caves in Southern China, where they're mostly found. That, that was working until 
January 2017, when Donald Trump came into office with his Republican sycophants. What did he do in the first days of his office? Dismantle the pandemic program, the pandemic response program. Start, can, started canceling the programs with American scientists working with Chinese colleagues. So we shouldn't know what, what's coming. In fact, he's continued that up until the last few, few weeks, in fact, canceling programs. Uh, defunding the Center for Disease Control. First act, defund the Center for Disease Control and other health-related parts of the government. He's tried to do that every single year in office. Astonishingly, even last February, pandemic raging, the budget comes from the White House. Further defunding of the Center for Disease Control, other health-related parts of government. That doesn't fit the agenda of serving uh, the ultra wealthy and the corporate sector. The one significant commitment of the president of the party, other than maintaining his own power, that's who they serve. So let's fund anything that could protect the population. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, fire the chief scientist in charge of vaccine development. In charge of vaccine development. Why? Because he raised some questions about the quack medicines that Trump is advertising. I mean, what's happening before our eyes is as if some malicious devil took over the country. And it's not far from true, in fact. That's what we're facing for the election. Whether to allow this to go on for four years or to put a stop to it. It's not that the alternative is great. It's not. We should understand, I think, that we're not voting for Biden. We're voting against Trump. And we're going to challenge Biden if he wins and ensure that the donor-oriented sectors of the party will not cut off programs that have to be carried out and that young people like Sunrise Movement are pressing for all the time in the forefront with us following behind. We have to make sure to do that. That's a major task for the immediate future. Can't be delayed. Very important to understand that the means to solve these problems are within our hands. There are very good, careful studies by fine analysts, Bob Pollan, co-author of mine, Jeff Sachs, have worked out detailed programs which demonstrate how we can deal with the problem, not only at, at benefit to the society, better world, more jobs, less destruction, better lives, at a fraction of the expenses that were used to win the Second World War. It's not, it's not utopian. You know how to do it. It's not going to happen by, by itself. It's not going to happen if uh, the malignancy in the White House stays on, racing in the opposite direction. It will not happen if the DNC, the Clinton Democrats, manage to cut off all significant programs. But it can happen. We've seen the effects and the remarkable successes of the Sanders movement and the tremendous social movement that's in the streets right now, led by Black Lives Matter, and the courage and achievements of Sunrise Movement, uh, mutual support groups arising all over the world, uh, the Progressive International having its first international meeting in a couple of weeks, bringing together Sanders movement in the United States, TM25, the comparable movement in Europe, lots of voices in the global south, the meeting in Iceland in a couple of weeks. Iceland, because the prime minister is part of the movement, uh, to try to develop a counter to the reactionary international that's being constructed in the White House and is aiming 
they wouldn't put it in these words, but is acting in ways which will destroy the prospects for organizing in society in order to enrich and empower themselves. Okay, That's the conflict that's developing. And we can't let it lapse. There's no option of not engaging. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, actually, I'm, I'm going to be part of that too, my dear brother. I just was communicating with Brother Adley with this progressive international. It's multiracial, multinational, or internationalism or extinction, I think is your, your formulation of it, and rightly so. I want to move just briefly again though, on the personal thing, the precious people in your life that were formative. It could be your precious parents, Elsie and William, it could be the great Nelson Goodman, my teacher, I think one of the great towering figures in modern philosophy who's underappreciated. I think he's got his form of genius too. But how do you relate to figures in arts, in poetry, in literature? Who are the artists, past and present, who have made a difference in your life as scholar, as intellectual, as activist, as freedom fighter? as lover of justice, truth, and goodness. There are plenty of them, like people you mentioned, uh, wonderful scholars, uh, great activists, uh, but the people who, at least me, who really made an impression were the ones who our old friend, the late Howard Zinn called uh, those uh, unknown people whose there's countless unknown people whose actions set the stage for the events that enter history. Those are the impressive people. And for me, at least, that starts pretty early in my experiences. And some of my earliest memories are riding with my mother in trolley cars in North Philadelphia, going past textile plants where women were on strike outside the plant being brutally attacked by security officers. That's the kind of memory that sinks in. It was all around. In the later years, it was learning about the struggles of poor and suffering people here and around the world. We've seen many of them, the kind of inspiration you can't get from anything else. People in who, are, who don't give up, who are facing the kinds of uh, torture, repression that we can't even imagine, but don't give up, keep their heads up, keep struggling, win victories. That's the kind of thing that's an inspiration, the way beyond anything you can see at the university, in the library, although there's enormous riches there from which you can benefit. Mm -hmm. In terms of the particular secular Jewish tradition that you exemplify in such a marvelous way, are there resources that you discern within the Hebrew scripture that Hesed, spreading steadfast love to orphan widow, fatherless mother, is there something about justice, justice thou should, thou should, thou should pursue? Is there something about the ways in which your own shaping of your identity, and this is very important these days when everybody's talking about their identity, the shaping of your identity has always led toward this universalism, even though there's still something distinctively Chomskyan, Philadelphian, American, New World, Jewish, all mixed together in making your witness what it is. It's all in there. Uh, I mean, I grew up with... Uh, in a household that was immersed in the uh, revival of Hebrew culture. Uh, my father was a great Hebrew scholar. I mean, my earliest lessons in linguistics, which I ended up with, were reading his dissertation on a medieval Hebrew grammarian when I was maybe 10 or 12 years old, learning about historical Semitic grammar and so on. Uh, reading the Bible, I was immersed in that. Uh, the later Hebrew literature, uh, you can't read the prophets and not be inspired by 
the eloquent calls for justice, for mercy, the sharp critiques of uh, the crimes of the powerful, geopolitical critiques, moral critiques. That's one part of the Bible. There are other, quite other parts which have a very ugly message, but you pick and choose. Now that's all in the background. Uh, one of the places where I learned about the concept of uh, of self-hating Jews, very common today, criticize the state of Israel, you're a self-hating Jew. You listen to Abba Eban, great Israeli statesman, statesman, revered statesman, about 40 years ago, gave a lecture to American Jews in one of the main liberal Jewish journals in which he said, your task is to show that there's no difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, where anti-Zionism meant support for his government in Israel. No difference between those. Well, you read the Bible, you grew up in the Bible, you know exactly where he's coming from. Go back to Kings, remember the epitome of evil in the Bible, King Ahab, called the prophet Elijah to him, denounced the prophet Elijah as a Oher Yisrael, a hater of Israel, because he was condemning the acts of the evil king. And that's the origin. When you remember that, it gives you a different perspective on what's happening today. In fact, when you think of the fate of the prophets, it tells you something. They were not treated well. They were imprisoned and driven into the desert, they were ridiculed, persecuted. There were people who were treated well, the flatterers at the court. Uh, many centuries later, many centuries, they were condemned as false prophets, not at the mm. time. That tells you something about intellectual history. You go back to the Stax and Widener Library, where I got a lot of my education, learn about intellectual history, you find that that message has been relived over and over again, right to the present. And the people who are calling for mercy, justice, concern for the poor and the suffering, they're the ones who, they're the ones who are attacked. We've seen it over and over. And take, say, the Catholic Church, remarkable institution. 1962, Pope John XXIII called Vatican II and had a message. Let's try to go back to the lesson of the Gospels. The lesson of the Gospels is the preferential option for the poor. It's a message of radical pacifism. Let's go back to that. That actually was taken up by the, mostly in Latin America, some other places by uh, bishops, priests, uh, lay people who went out to organize peasants, read the gospels, see what they say, follow the message of taking control of your own lives instead of suffering from the miserable brutality of the murderous governments, most of them installed and backed by the United States. It's called liberation theology. Take a look at the talking points of the School of Americas. It's now renamed, but the School of the Americas, which trains Latin American officers, Latin American killers to be exact. They have advertising points. One of them is the United States Army helped destroy liberation theology. They're saying something true. 1962, the United States government went to war against the Catholic Church. That's why you have a host of religious martyrs all over Latin America. That's why you have the martyred Archbishop Romero, the six Jesuit intellectuals murdered at the Jesuit University in 1989, right at the time the Berlin Wall fell by pretty much the same hands by an elite battalion armed and trained by the United States following orders which we know were given directly by the Central Command. Okay, 
Yes, the United States Army helped defeat the Gospels, helped defeat the, the t- teachings of the, of the church, okay? That should be front and center in our consciousness, just like the fate of the prophets and the many others like them since then. They're the yeah. ones who really suffer, okay? The ones who bring the message of honesty, integrity, uh, support for people who need it, preferential option for the poor, working for the suffering and the needy, changing our societies so that they are directed to people's just rights and needs instead of for maximizing wealth and profit for a tiny sector. Those are the people who are bitterly attacked. They're the ones who, uh, in a famous article, uh, McGeorge Bundy, the national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson, a former dean of Harvard, wrote a very interesting article in 1968 at the peak of the anti-war movement about how, yes, we've made some foreign affairs, the main establishment journal worth reading. He said, yeah, we haven't been perfect. We made some mistakes and you can, it's fair to say, talk about our mistakes. But he said, there are also wild men in the wings wild men in the wings, like all of us, people who say, it's not just a mistake, it's a crime. Wild men in the wings, okay? Mm. You read the prophets, you know where that's coming from. Yes, there's a history, a lot in between. Uh, Take a look at the Dreyfus affair, the time when the modern concept of intellectual came into general use. There were people who we now honor, the Dreyfusards, Emil Zola, people like him. We honor them, not at the time. They were bitterly condemned, denounced. Zola had to flee France. They were condemned by the immortals of the French Academy, the Academy Francaise, the how dare you, the writers and uh, artists, uh, criticize our noble army and our noble state and claim that they committed a crime. Flee the country before we get you, okay? That's a large part of history. If you go back and read, it goes back to classical Greece as well. Who was the person who had to drink the hemlock? The person who was corrupting the youth of Athens by asking too many questions, getting them to think getting them to question things. We don't want people like that around. We don't want wild men in the wings. Now it's dangerous to authority and power. And it also carries civilized life forward all over the place. People whose names nobody knows. How many people know the names of the young black kids who 60 years ago sat in a lunch, lunch counter at Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, segregated lunch counter, immediately carried off. Could have ended it, except that others came later. Pretty soon you had freedom riders. You had snake workers going out in the South, uh, trying to get terrorized black farmers to dare to vote. Suffering, beaten, killed. Anybody know their names? Those are the what Howard called the countless unknown people who create the basis for the events in history that make a difference. And they're among us right now, like the mm-hmm. kids well, in the street. Professor, mm-hmm. Professor yes, Chomsky, yes, yes. Yeah, just brilliant and incredibly inspiring because, you know, it's, it's, it's the unknowns and everyday people who who we need now more than ever. Um, I know we've taken up a lot of your time here. I understand you're on a schedule and have more. I'm sure everyone wants to hear what you have to say. And in this moment, there's so much crisis. Um, But this has been a great honor and incredibly uh, rich and and powerful conversation. And we're, I know I'm I'm just personally very grateful for you to make time to join us on the show. And I, I know Professor West feels 
the same. Uh, oh, I don't know, Cornell, you want to say oh, something? Oh, yeah, no, I just want to express my deep love and respect for my dear brother. I'm telling you, you mean so much to us. And to well, know what you're doing, that's keeping the flames burning. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. There well, you thank go. you very much, Professor Chomsky, so for that's joining it. us on the tightrope. You're welcome back anytime, anytime. Absolutely. All right, I have to leave you. Enjoyed it. All, All right. right. Well, thank you very much for being with us, our tightrope people. We're really thrilled that you join us as often as you do. And we especially want to thank a big shout out to Dwayne and the Real News Network team for their production and support. Don't forget to follow us on all kinds of social media, subscribe, and join us the next time on The Tightrope. Always a blessing to be with you, my dear sister, Tricia. Thank you.